Entering the series in third gen, Devil Joe quickly became a fan favourite, with its renowned gluttony and frequent quest interruptions. He's also steeped in some of the most excessive fan theories and suggested lore especially regarding his savage variant. But does the fan lore hold up? Why is he so hungry and destructive all the time? And is it possible for a multitude of reasons that they could actually deserve our pity over our hatred and fear? First off, let's dive into the pretty exorbitant lore around Devil Joe. The most common type of claim in just about every video surrounding him being that he's so hungry he destroys entire ecosystems. He literally ravages the land, he eats every organism around him, and strips the very biome bare. This likely initially comes from the claim from his info in Try, which claims that he can hunt nearby animals to extinction. So this is pretty vague to start off with, and is likely a case of the fan community just taking something and running with it. Because above all else, the whole Devil Joe is the ecosystem destroyer is just not how ecology works. Ecosystems aren't contained little boxes with X amount of animals in them at one time that can be depleted in days. They're open systems constantly flowing in and out of each other. Animals disperse and move and migrate through them at will. So the notion of something just draining all the vertebrates from an area like a heron taking goldfish from a garden pond is just really ridiculous. What's more, it's pretty impossible to do as well. If the energetic requirements of Devil Joe are so extreme that it did allow it to create such a black hole of life, to so thoroughly deplete an area of large animals, then the time it takes for Devil Joe to traverse from that depleted area to a non-depleted one would no doubt be fatal to it due to starvation. This isn't a this wouldn't work in our own world with our own laws of physics situation. This is a the thing you've suggested can't exist within the parameters of your own idea suggestion. If it is literally so hungry, then it just wouldn't be able to survive that journey after having that effect on an ecosystem. And finally, don't worry, I will be exploring more aspects of Devil Joe than just this. Devil Joe can't really destroy an ecosystem by just removing animals. Plants and microorganisms still exist there. Unless Devil Joe is literally ripping out trees and scraping the ferns from the ground, that ecosystem can still replenish itself pretty quickly. But again, it's important to remember that it's not entirely Capcom or the Monster Hunter team that specified Devil Joe as the mega, ultra, super ecosystem ruiner, even if they gave him the fun nickname of World Eater. The more extreme aspects of it are very much a fan invention. If anything, Capcom tried to move away from this with its info and world, not really mentioning it. As well as this, top order carnivores can have some quite noticeable effects on their ecosystems. So let's explore some of those in conjunction with the more restrained lore Capcom initially gave. It's important to note that they specified nearby animals. So some animals in the immediate area, and not necessarily every living thing. And threatening a localised extinction of certain species isn't actually as hard as you might think. Not all herbivores live at equal measures. For all the hyper-common species like wildebeest, deer or capybara, there are far rarer ones that live at naturally low densities. Or animals common in one area may be a threatened species in another. For the low density animals, even common predators can sometimes pose a serious threat to their small populations. A study of pumas in New Mexico found that pumas were a strong factor in the decline of bighorn sheep in the San Andreas Mountains. And when factoring in the other causes of mortality too, this population soon went extinct. One puma in particular was translocated by the researchers due to likely being the chief one responsible for the decline due to its taste in sheep. Another similar but less extreme scenario also occurred with a separate population in Alberta, where a single female led to the decline of a population. So the notion of even a single animal strongly contributing to local extinctions, in the right circumstances, isn't so far-fetched. This is also something to consider too, that herbivores have a life outside of just being eaten, and that there are other things as well as predation that can cause their declines. Sometimes predation can often just be the final nail in a coffin. On top of this, Capcom further narrow it down a bit in the World Art book, by seemingly claiming that the whole Devil Joe eating a whole area was just a single incident, and possibly with some hearsay as well. This makes it a lot more believable, as again, this isn't that hard to imagine. In just about any fenced game reserve with large predators, new prey animals need to be brought in annually at least, as obviously new ones can't disperse in naturally. Similarly, in island ecosystems, dominant predators can cause localised extinctions of various prey. The little Channel Islands fox was almost wiped out by golden eagles who became resident in the islands after DDT rendered bald eagles extinct there. 
In short, any form of isolation may well result in a situation that allows Devil Joe to fully decimate a population of animals. A flood or landslide or Devil Joe getting marooned on an island could all result in the localised extinctions of the animals there. But predators don't just affect the movements and the lives of their prey by killing them, for there is also a behavioural phenomenon known as the landscape of fear. This is how much the risk of predation affects the choices an animal makes in its daily cycle of activity. Much like a physical one, this landscape undulates with the various factors like time of day, the terrain, the demographics of the animals in question, and so on. This factor will apply all over the world of Monster Hunter, with the varying suites of predator-prey interactions seen in the series. The influence of a large aggressive predator like Devil Joe with no real habitat preference may ultimately cause already stressed and highly vigilant herbivores to move out of an area due to its influence on an already existing landscape of fear. As well, there is a subset of this, the landscape of harassment too. Even if you're not being directly eaten by something, constantly having someone try to attempt it isn't great for you. It causes stress, and trying to get them to stop costs time and energy that could be spent doing more important things. For a lot of rival predators and larger wyverns, this may be the shape of their interactions with Devil Joe. Even if Devil Joe can't kill and eat them, his constant harassment may cause them to temporarily leave an area. Overall, these behavioural phenomena go to show how you can still have noticeable effects on an area and temporarily cause depletions of animals without necessarily having to eat everything in it. So if you can't eat everyone, what exactly does Devil Joe eat? If you ask me what I think Devil Joe's mouth is designed to eat, I'd probably tell you that it was designed by an 8 year old who thought the Indominus Rex was the best thing in the whole Jurassic franchise. If you pulled a gun on me and asked me for a serious answer, I'd probably say it looks maybe designed to catch slippery fish. Almost like the interlocking teeth of a gharial, but on meth. But we know this isn't what Devil Joe ideally likes to eat. If nothing else, Devil Joe still has a lot of pointed teeth and a reasonably wide gape. So it may not be unreasonable that if his jaw is designed to do anything, it could be to take large ripping bites to leave wounds with severe blood loss. On this note too, Devil Joe seemingly has quite a weak bite force. In the World Art Book, it says he's unable to bite through the shells of Apsaros. So unlike the Tyrannosaur-like jaws of Tigrex and Anjanath, Devil Joe isn't really built to hold and crush. Indeed, when manhandling smaller monsters, he seems to use his large size primarily to inflict blunt force trauma on them. The large theropods Giganotosaurus and Acrocanthosaurus may be reasonable analogues for Devil Joe. With jaws designed to inflict slicing wounds, and the main bite force being at the tip of the jaws. Which is what we'd expect from Devil Joe, as that's mainly where the teeth are. The dinosaurs in question likely hunted the sauropods they lived alongside, inflicting slashing wounds for large blood loss on giant opponents they weren't likely to wrestle down with their jaws. They also didn't really have much adaptation for eating bone, with a sheer amount of meat on their carcasses too. Again, like Devil Joe, who doesn't really have the bite to handle tougher foods, it seems. On the opposite end, Devil Joe has a very noticeable tail, which is to say a massively thick one. This may make it somewhat similar to that of Carnotaurus and other Abelosaurids. Here's a conservative and a more robust reconstruction of what the musculature they may have had looked like, and the more robust option does indeed look like Devil Joe's massive tail. The muscles in question are the M. cordofemoralis which function as the primary femoral retractor and one of the key muscles overall in powering the hind limb. In Carnotaurus, it's believed this allowed it to move at great speed, which is something we know Devil Joe doesn't really do. But it could be possible that this extreme musculature is actually what's necessary for Devil Joe to have efficient bipedal movement at this size. Devil Joe dwarfs a lot of other monsters, and pretty much most of the wyverns too, with only a handful of others approaching his size. Basil Juice's primary method of locomotion is flight, and the Bloss Wyverns mainly burrow likely as quadrupeds. It's worth noting in his fight too, Basil also moves as a quadruped quite a bit as well. Gravios and Durambaros seem to live life in the slow lane and probably don't do a lot of moving if they can help it. Most things larger than Devil Joe, like some Elders, Akantor, and Yukonlos, are quadrupeds. Whilst Monster Hunter may have a different and more extreme set of physics to our own world, it still has its own established laws. Clearly, there's a point where the body size necessitates quadrupedal movement, and Devil Joe may be the final point before that switch, requiring unique and heavy musculature for it to be efficient. It may also be just that too, a case of efficiency. In the giant theropods, especially tyrannosaurs, there's always been the question of how fast they could run for the ostensible purpose of seeing whether they could catch swift prey or not but recent research has found their limb design may be for energy saving in day-to-day -day movement. 
over who has the fastest sprint. Giant theropods likely had massive territories to patrol and to find mates or food in, so efficient walking would save them a hell of a lot of energy at the sizes they reached considering just how much of their day was spent on the move. This is especially applicable to Devil Joe, who is repeatedly stated to have no territory and to live its life as a nomad. He would need a very efficient walking setup for this, or he'll be burning even more energy than normal for such a massive animal. All of this has somewhat left a bit of a gamoth in the room. What is Devil Joe designed to eat, and why does Devil Joe seem so poorly adapted to the current world of Monster Hunter? Well, maybe that's because it's not his world anymore. When we look at the map of Monster Hunter, we see the ocean separating the old and new worlds, as well as the Moga Archipelago and other islands. One of these is likely to be the Jurassic Frontier. Despite being cut off from the mainland, these islands still have large terrestrial fauna that would be very unlikely to swim there. So how did they get there? There is something similar that occurred in our own world and it happened in the last ice age. More water being frozen at the poles means lower sea levels, and land bridges formed where they don't exist today, such as the Bering Strait, and much of the sea around the United Kingdom actually being lowland valleys. A personal theory I'll come back to a few times in this series is that fairly recently, the last 10,000 years or so, the world of Monster Hunter came out of an ice age of its own. This also explains the presence of animals associated with the new world in the old world and vice versa, as likely there was a swampy land bridge between the old and new worlds. In our own world, this was a phenomenon known as the Great American Interchange, when the Isthmus of Panama formed and allowed ground sloths, glyptodonts and pterobards to move north, and saber-toothed direwolves and mammoths to move south across the Americas. As well as land bridges and mixing fauna, the world would also be very different. Ice ages don't just mean everything is colder, they also mean less rainfall for a lot of places as it falls as snow instead. It also means huge changes in the vegetation too. Whilst the whole world doesn't become a tundra, rainforests and tropical wetlands would be a lot smaller and more limited in distribution. Then there is a lot more grassland and open woodland too. This all leads to a very different world. The dominating species that are very widespread in the current world, like Rathalos, Yain, Skaruga, and Kutku, Aptonoth, and Velociprey would be much more limited in range. Tigrex may have been the likely most common predator in the open steppes. Gamoth were more frequent, and possibly even lived in herds. And Popo were likely the most common herbivore. Not only this, but some species may well have gone extinct prior to even the first game. Larinoths are seemingly the only sauropod-like animals in the world of Monster Hunter and are only found in the Jurassic Frontier Island. Prior to the climate change that ended the period of glaciation, they and other larger sauropod-like animals not subject to island dwarfism may well have been present and even common across the mainland. So what does all this mean for Devil Joe? My main theory is that Devil Joe was designed to hunt the mega herbivores of the last ice age, sauropod-like animals and gamoth primarily. This seems to be, to me, the best explanation for his bizarre mouth, as like some dinosaurs he was designed to inflict open wounds to cause blood loss on giant prey it couldn't just wrestle down. It may well have been nomadic, as its food was as well, it just followed the herds until hunting opportunities prevented themselves for a meal that would then last for weeks. Devil Joe also never adapted to crush bone or hard materials, as it ate animals with enough meat on them it didn't need to. Devil Joe I ultimately view as the Monster Hunter equivalent to something like a Giganotosaurus. Massive, not especially fast, but with a slashing bite possibly designed for huge prey. Whilst it's hard to imagine Devil Joe ever really living at a high density, Devil Joe still doesn't really fit in with any ecosystem as they're not the ones he's adapted to. On this note too, Devil Joe as a species may well be on its last legs. The foggy lore around Savage Devil Joe was finally cleared up in Iceborne when it was confirmed to be a mutation. Mutations are somewhat demonised with their stigma around the word, but most of them in nature are just benign. They don't really make much difference. Some can be advantageous and lead to new adaptions, and some can be deleterious and lead to that individual's demise. And this is unquestionably what Savage Devil Joe is. Presumably this mutation doesn't kick in until sexual maturity, but it ultimately means that this animal won't pass on its genes. The fact that this defective gene seems fairly common in the already rare Devil Joe and yet behaviourally prevents reproduction suggests Devil Joe don't have a great gene pool. With savage individuals, it's only getting more shallow too. 
This may even somewhat explain the bizarre mouth. Brute wyverns like Anginath and Glorinus have a keratinous sheath around the mouth, but in Devil Joe this is all actual teeth, unevenly erupting and compacting each other. In Sweden, a population of wolves were cut off from the mainland and quickly began to fall into severe inbreeding. A feature sometimes seen in this population was severe dental abnormalities, although not quite as extreme as Devil Joe's. Such aberrations can often be seen in inbred populations overall too. An animal that looks severely inbred on the outside is also often doing much worse on the inside, often suffering very poor reproduction or flat out infertility, decreased longevity, organ defects, blindness or loss of sense of smell, and severe skeletal deformations too. Devil Joe also canonically suffers from some of these as well, being confirmed to have a short lifespan which isn't really what we'd expect from such a large animal. It's possible their metabolism may actually be another defective trait, or even an interpretation of their digestive organs malfunctioning. Devil Joe also seem to possess organ defects with whichever one produces their dragon element, to the point of it being fatal to that individual. In short, Devil Joe have a suite of severe deleterious attributes that seem to be well correlated with severe inbreeding depression. This is the same story that happened to some of the giants of our own last Ice Age too. The large and diverse prey that Sabretooths preferred disappeared with changes in the climate and the vegetation, and the unique cats that were built for great strength followed them into extinction as well, as their prey both disappeared and was more efficiently utilised by competitors. The last of the mammoths shared a similar fate. A recent study showing that even without human hunting, woolly mammoths only had another 4,000 years before their inevitable extinction. One population on Wrangell Island off the northern coast of Russia shows that this population was stranded by climate change when the seas rose and the ice pack receded, stranding them on this island. This population later fell into severe inbreeding too, likely losing their ability to detect certain scents and having numerous defective organs and reduced fertility. On top of all of this, Devil Joe also has humans to contend with. It's worth noting, in-universe, no one actually likes Devil Joe. The World Art Book, which is meant to be a scientific treatise, describes it as cruel or sadistic, when it's just an animal without morality. Most of its quests seem to suggest that the guild just have a shoot on sight policy for Devil Joe, and among the native civilizations of the world they're also said to bring bad luck, and to be considered omens of bad fortune, but for fairly obvious reasons. My degrees are in zoology and ecology, not history, but I'd very roughly put the civilization of Monster Hunter at roughly the same as the 19th century. Steam power exists, science is slowly taking off, and semi-advanced weaponry and technology already seem to exist. This civilization is likely on the cusp of an industrial revolution, and quite possibly the habitat fragmentation and increases in human-wildlife conflict that would come with it. Devil Joe may be a severe victim of this, with the huge ranges it traverses over. That's even if Devil Joe's incredibly limited gene pool isn't already terminal for this species' long-term survival. The extreme lore and aberrant behaviour surrounding Devil Joe may just be the violent death throes of a final lineage of doomed prehistoric giants. But all of this is conjecture on my behalf. Unless straight from Capcom, my videos aren't canon, they're just theory and my opinions. So with a slightly depressing science turn, I do like to discuss my thoughts on the monsters informally. If you're a devout Devil Joe fan, you might just want to fast forward to the debrief and the bit where I say what we're doing next time. As this video has been punishing enough already, and you don't need to hear me rant further about Joe. So as you may have gathered from a few subtle hints in this video, I have a lot of mixed feelings about Devil Joe. On one hand, I do love the general vibe of it. I really like the giant notion of a giant, gluttonous, nomadic theropod monster. Thematically, I think it's a great addition to the franchise, with a fitting music track and great gear too. I also think Iceborne's Savage Devil Joe is fantastic. His aggression and reckless moves like just flinging himself bodily at you and his dragon nuke really do make the fight feel like a diseased, mad monster. I think one of my main two bugbears with it is just the design, and especially the mouth. It's just so ugly and poorly designed. I do get that they were probably trying to stay away from a general T-Rex and soup it up a bit, but good god, how do they wind up with that snaggletooth duck's beak as the best choice? Devil Joe scarcely looks like he can eat, let alone kill anything, and as such it's hard to buy him as this amazing super predator. On the same note as well, it was also kind of hard to buy him as effectively the final word on frontal combat when turf wars were introduced. To be fair, Base World and Iceborne's turf war system is a bit squiffy. The notion of a monster's quest rank deciding whether it wins or loses the turf war is a bit of a broken system. 
And with Iceborne, the results were all over the place anyway, with the various subspecies too. The few we've seen in Rise so far do seem to look a bit more like an actual struggle, where there is one winner, but it's much more of an overall fight. Overall, this mechanic is still very new. Considering that the series started with using the right analog stick to fight, it shows how much and how quickly it can evolve. But with that said, some of Devil Joe's turf wars are kind of bad. His ones against flying wyverns are pretty fine, but then there's Odogron and Diablos. It was poor enough that Odogron, a monster established to not fear elder dragons or large brute wyverns, literally cowered as Devil Joe approaches it at a snail's pace. To be clear, I don't think Odogron stands much chance at taking down a Devil Joe, or indeed any of the predatory brute wyverns, but it's pretty egregious to have the high progressive Napoleon monster just refuse to defend itself in any way so Devil Joe can win. Diablos, on the other hand, I absolutely do believe is strong enough to take a Devil Joe. Now, flat out winning is debatable, but I think their turf war really should have been an epic showdown. Rather than Diablos slowly walking up, attempting a weak jab, and then putting up no resistance when grabbed. These turf wars only look even worse when Glavinus entered. Odogron does get battered, to be honest, but it shows he's not scared of giant brutes and has the agility to at least land a hit or two. Diablos is established as strong enough to take several face dunks and then have the strength to fling an adult Glavinus. No matter how strong Devil Joe is, Diablos absolutely should have been able to do more, and at least to free itself from the initial grab. I also feel Capcom missed something of a trick here in that they could have had the T-Rex Wyvern versus the Ceratopsian Wyvern in World. I've always felt Diablos could have been the most fitting cultural rival for Joe, as it allows them to have the good old T-Rex versus Triceratops fight, but what do I know? Overall, these turf wars are just so one-sided they don't make Devil Joe look badass. They just make his opponents look stupid, because they make no effort to actually fight. Devil Joe's turf wars in World also feels so much like a spoiled kid's birthday party, because to the Monster Hunter team, that's sort of what he is. In the art book, the developers say how he was given his own DLC for fanfare and the measures they went to so it wouldn't be overshadowed by Basil Juice. But when implemented in Base World, Basil Juice didn't have a single turf war, and as of the final Iceborne updates, it still only has one, and it's with Devil Joe. The fact that they undermined what was meant to be Devil Joe's equal and rival, and who was a never fought before world exclusive in favour of giving returning Devil Joe OP turf wars, does annoy me quite a bit, and rant over. And to you, thanks for watching. And thanks once again for all your comments and positive words. To address a few of them, I do absolutely plan to do a lot of the Iceborne Returners. It's just that I'm waiting for the art book to be released with all that extra juicy info. Obviously, if it's not out by a certain time, I'll go ahead anyway, but know that's why they'll be a bit later on in this series. And do keep making suggestions too. Bad note, Aquino made the great theory that Damio Hermitors use monoblos shells more so than Diablos skulls, due to them being more easily found with illicit hunting. And as ever, please do share these with others who may be interested. The more who see them, the more interesting theories we get to include. And as ever, my usual hopes for likes and subscriptions too. Hopefully I haven't lost anyone with my treasonous statements today. Monster Hunter Rise also comes out today, so I hope all of you with a Switch will be busy diving in. I don't have one myself, but I'll be mining various gameplay videos for new turf wars, cutscenes, and ecology bites for this series. Next episode will be off to Middle Earth to examine the wargs and the fell beast. I plan to cover more than just Monster Hunter in this channel, but it'll probably be a 3 to 1 Monster Hunter to non Monster Hunter ratio. So if there are any other franchises you'd be interested in, once again, don't hesitate to suggest them. But for the Monster Hunter Puritans, here's your teaser for the next monster to be covered.